This will probably sound strange for anybody born in my generation, but believe it or not, there was a time when the West End was just as popular as the average superhero blockbuster. If you thought Marvel and DC movies have become oversaturated these last few years, imagine what it was like for people during the 1940s and 60s, who were flooded with classic westerns, spaghetti westerns, audio dramas, books, and TV shows. Naturally, their output was heavily slowed down from the 70s onward, just like every other mainstream trend that falls out of favor. But the genre itself never actually died. Every so often, you would see the rare but incredibly well-produced outliers like Pale Rider, Tombstone, or 310 to Yuma, all of which proved that no matter how much time has passed, people are still willing to see stories about lone Avengers carving out their own justice in a lawless land, and the struggles of trying to survive on a hazardous frontier while also being cut off from the rest of society. I believe the Western has stuck around for so long because they offer some of the most honest depictions of human nature you'll find in any story, since this was a time all about people trying to survive unfamiliar territory while being free from most forms of governmental or societal oversight. It's a writer's playground for exploring their characters in great depth. That's exactly what famed NYPD Blue writer David Milch realized when he debuted Deadwood on HBO back in 2003. Unlike the other shows I've covered on this channel so far, Deadwood's already considered to be one of the greatest TV shows of all time. But surprisingly, there aren't that many videos on YouTube discussing why that is. So what's all of the fuss about, you may ask? Is it all because of the amazing production design? The star-studded cast? Its depiction of historical events? Does the hype all boil down to how often people call each other cocksuckers? Well, there's truth to all of those things, but I would say the main reason behind why Deadwood is so beloved is because of the writing. I've watched a lot of shows across multiple genres, and I fully admit I'm not as big of a western fan as I am a sci-fi, fantasy, or espionage fan. But despite all of that, Deadwood has some of the best character arcs, season-spanning plotlines, and immersive world-building I've ever seen. You can tell from almost every frame just how much effort was put into making these characters and this setting as believable as possible, which all serves towards making it feel like you're actually peering through history and seeing real-life events play out, even the parts that are completely fictional. It wouldn't be much of an exaggeration to say David Milch and his team approached Deadwood with the same level of dedication as Peter Jackson did with Lord of the Rings, right down to adapting stories from the real-life Deadwood newspaper and collaborating with the actors in shaping their storylines. If you're looking for a series that feels as real as a documentary, yet also doesn't skimp on having engaging storylines and great characters, Deadwood is absolutely worth watching. Believe me when I say that Deadwood's unlike any other western or TV show out there, so even if the concept doesn't do anything for you, it still stands out compared to other serious adult-oriented dramas. Of course, if that doesn't interest you, you can always watch it for how often people elegantly curse at each other, or to see which unfortunate soul will be fed to Mr. Wu's pigs next. I guarantee they'll always spice things up if you're ever feeling bored. Anyway, let's get into Deadwood. Deadwood tells the story of the real-life camp of the same name that was established in the region we now know today as South Dakota during the 1870s. I'm sure many people have heard the phrase, there's gold in them dar hills, at some point in their lives, which is precisely what Colonel Custer's expedition into the Black Hills discovered. Naturally, this sparked a mad dash of everyone from hopeful prospectors to opportunistic businessmen to flood the area. Deadwood was considered an illegal settlement that stood apart from the rest of the United States. No government presence means nobody to enforce the laws, or even any laws at all. The only kind of order being enforced in Deadwood was the kind that played directly to the interests of the people with the most influence and ruthless enforcers at their disposal, mainly Al Swearingen, head of the local brothel and drug smuggling operation. Between that and managing who gets to own which property and gold claim in Deadwood, he pretty much ran the entire place as his own seedy drug den and prostitute dispensary at the beginning of the series. His control gets thrown into a loop when three new figures arrive in town. Seth Bullock, a former U.S. Marshal looking to start a quiet new life but still maintains a strong code of honor and justice, 
Wild Bill Hickok, a famed gunslinger who has his own code of ethics and intolerance for foul play, and Cy Tolliver, a direct business competitor to Al Swearingen, who's also looking to gain power and influence over the camp. Once they arrive, things can't run as smoothly for Al as they used to, now that he has to contend with do-gooders like Seth and Wild Bill, and Cy muscling in on his territory, while also attracting more government types to snoop around. The show follows the daily lives of these characters along with many others connected to them through various means, as they all try to make their own living, but inevitably end up coming to blows on many fronts, especially Seth and Al. Unlike most TV shows, Deadwood doesn't have an overarching plot. It's more like a collection of individual stories that are all taking place simultaneously that just happen to intersect with one another in unexpected ways. One aspect I love about Deadwood is how alive and interconnected the town itself feels. In most movies and TV shows, a city is just a collection of tall buildings and nice sets filled with nameless extras being told to move to random locations while the cameras are rolling in order to make the place feel lived in. But in truth, everything you see only exists to facilitate telling one story about a handful of people that's mostly disconnected from everything happening around it. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, or it's unrealistic that most people don't know what's happening with everyone else during all hours of the day, but what makes Deadwood special is how it feels like everyone you see, whether it's a main character talking in front of the camera, or a random extra in the background, are all part of one giant ecosystem. For example, when Seth and Wild Bill shoot down one of Al Swearingen's thugs in front of the entire town, it drives multiple people to draw their own conclusions about who they are, why they're in town, and what their long-term goals are. Some people think they're heroes, others believe they're loose cannons who will cause more trouble for them down the road, or they're just seen as ordinary guys who don't like being pushed around. It causes every person they meet to treat them differently based on those three perspectives. Or in Al's case, try to figure out which one applies to Seth through various meetings, taking note of all of his actions by having his underlings spy on him, or just through seeing how he responds to certain snide comments. Luck trouble didn't jump out earlier, huh, Bullock? Might have found you mid-thrust at other business. What is it? Taken by a vision? Be where I can find you. I ain't going no place. Notice how we see other people react to their conversation? That usually drives them to do something on their own in that same episode, which may or may not have an impact on how this feud between Al and Seth play out, or their future interactions with them. It all depends on who that character is, and their perspective on this scene. That's what makes the setting of Deadwood and its people feel more real than any other show I've seen, because every storyline and decision a character makes are all influenced by each other, and can all change on a dime when we least expected, just like events in real life. While Deadwood doesn't have an overarching main plot, it does have several overarching ideas and themes that carry through every storyline across the show, like people coming together to form a strong community in the face of overwhelming odds, putting aside differences to achieve a common goal, or learning to overcome cruel challenges life can throw your way when you least expect it. It all serves to tell the story about how the people of Deadwood, despite their issues, came together to form a strong community, and were actually more civil and cooperative than most historians give the Wild West credit for. There may have been very little stopping people from murdering or robbing each other back then, but when it came time to solving a major issue that affected all of Deadwood, whether it was curing a plague, hunting down a major criminal, or ensuring people had real ownership over the lands they bought, it's pretty heartwarming seeing how many of these people stood up for one another in ways I doubt many neighbors of metropolitan cities ever would. Deadwood is more about showing the everyday lives of these people than Old West gunfights, so while there are action scenes peppered here and there, the main focus is how all of this affects the characters and what they do going forward. I'm sure there are some people out there who must think that sounds pretty boring, but once things get going, Deadwood can build up to some truly spectacular payoffs, unlike many shows today. It's high time I explain why by giving my overview of the characters, because they're the heart of what makes this show great. Get down off your horse. Listen to me. I'm an innocent man and... Them Indians, goddammit! Too much ransacking, and too many goods left behind. Get down off your horse, or face the consequences. Ah! 
There really isn't a main character in Deadwood, but out of everyone from its ensemble cast, Seth Bullock typically gets more focus than most. I can confidently say that Deadwood was changed forever once he showed up and established himself as a fearless crusader who wouldn't stand for any injustice committed right in front of him and couldn't be bought out. However, that's not to say he came to camp with the intention of just becoming the sheriff. At the beginning of the series, we get to see his final night as the US Marshal for Montana, where he makes it clear that his only intention behind going to Deadwood was to open a hardware store with his partner, Saul Starr. Their plans get interrupted, however, when a lynch mob shows up in front of his office and demands he turn over his last prisoner for them to execute personally. The sight of this rabid mob disgusts Seth to his core, because while he doesn't always agree with the law, he can't stand watching degenerates exploited in order to serve their twisted form of justice. Handing over a convicted man to be murdered is no different to Seth than endorsing everyone to become wild savages when the law doesn't work in their favor. So, he decides to dispense justice the only way he can. Any more gunplay gets answered. You called the law in, Samson. You don't get to call it off just because you're liquored up and popular on payday. You don't get to tell us what to do and what not to do. Because you're leaving Montana anyways. Now do not jump off of that stool, you cocksucker. Or what? You'll kill me? You tell my sister. If my boy turns up, raise him good. What else? Tell him his daddy loved him. Tell him he asked God's forgiveness. Fuck you! Seth's commitment to sticking by his morals and upholding justice for both his friends and adversaries is what leads him to become such a respected figure in Deadwood and the biggest thorn in Al Swearingen's side. Even though there are a few things in the show that deviate from Seth Bullock's real life story, mainly his relationship with Alma Garrett while being married to his brother's widow, Timothy Oliphant still does an amazing job capturing his famous honorable persona and willingness to throw down with anyone who's out to cause trouble. But his actions also inspired many others around him to band together and make this lawless town a real home where most people who were out to make an honest living for themselves could actually prosper. The mere fact that a school, a bank, and even a postal service popped up in Deadwood prove how far the camp evolved as time went on. That being said, it isn't easy for Seth to always live by his principles, since he's shown to have a very explosive temper when pushed too far. It's one of the main reasons he and Al Swearingen become adversaries when they first meet, and is usually the driving force behind many of their confrontations. You and I know how it is, Mr. Swearingen. How what is? She gets a square shake, or I come for you. What if I come for you? You ready for that? I guess I better be. Then close your fucking store, because being ready for me will take care of your waking hours, and you better have someone to hand the task off to when you close your fucking eyes. Bullock seems at first glance that he's our hero. He's going to do the right thing. And then you realize he's the kind of guy who, as David says, wakes up every day and imagines beating the shit out of his father. He wants to be a good person. Yeah, he does, but he's got this dark fucking side that gets loose once in a while. He could go over the edge and get a little more violent than uh, he, I know more than he, he wants to. Bullock does things instinctively and regrets it, hates himself for it. The bloodiness and the anger causes him to be ripped up with guilt. And Swearingen does unconscionable things and he does them for a reason. And he's also capable of enormous acts of kindness. Whether they're exchanging hostile words or outright beating each other in the street, you can be sure that every scene between Seth Bullock and Al Swearingen is going to be a memorable one. Even if Seth had never become the sheriff, it's clear the two men would still have hated each other to the core because they're essentially polar opposites. However, while Seth may hate Al's duplicitous nature as much as Al hates his holier-than-thou attitude, one of the most interesting developments of the show is how often the two are forced to work together. Al may be a corrupt bastard who will take any chance to manipulate people, kill anyone who's become an inconvenience to him, or exploit loopholes in the law to his benefit, but he's one of the few people Seth can rely on to stand with him against corrupt lawmen and other conniving sorts who arrive in town to take people's gold claims and freedoms away from them. Seth may hate everything he stands for, 
but he needs someone like L to help him find ways to protect everyone's interests from outside forces who are just as backstabbing and corrupt as he is. After all, it's better to work with a devil you know than one you don't, which is something they both have to bitterly accept. I offer these, and I hope you'll wear them a good long fucking time in this fucking cap who's ever fucking thumb we're under. There's a certain need for what Bullock can provide. Swearingen knows if it was going to be his way, that the town would burn down every week. You know, you kind of need a guy like Bullock to help maintain a certain sense of law. He's very aware of what he can't do, of what Bullock can do. He can't be the face of the camp. Bullock is the face of the camp. I think that's where his and Swearingen's real true working relationship kind of begins right there. And things begin to take off from there. This uneasy partnership is what makes season 2 of Deadwood some of the best TV I've ever seen. But if there's one issue I have with the show's handling of it, it's with how long it takes for Seth to actually become the sheriff and make his devil's pact with Swearingen. Season 1's pacing can sometimes drag on, because throughout most of it, Seth and his partner Saul are just trying to run their hardware store without incident and keep out of trouble the best they can. That's not to say their storyline of trying to make peace with Al so they can set up their store or protecting Alma's gold claim from him are necessarily bad. It's just that the storyline itself feels like one giant setup for what's to come. And while it's understandable for Seth to not jump to become the sheriff after all the trouble he had as a marshal in Montana, it was still a little frustrating seeing him go on about how much he didn't want it, even when a bought out blowhard took the position first. Fortunately, he changes his mind fairly quickly once he confronts the first major threat to the camp and its people. And I guess you couldn't have asked for a better hook to watch season 2 than to see where Seth Bullock goes as the new sheriff. Helping people in need and being an honorable man were nothing more than good manners to Seth Bullock, but those qualities are what inspired others to look up to him and try to become better people themselves. Even though he wrestles with many challenges over the course of the show, like his budding feelings for Alma despite being married, resisting the temptation to become as savage as Al when the law hamstrings him in certain situations, or struggling to figure out what to do when complications in his personal life end up impacting his duties as sheriff, he still rises to the occasion whenever some Somebody needs his help, or the camp itself needs someone to be their voice. Like I said earlier, Deadwood doesn't really have a main character, but Seth Bullock is absolutely one of its most compelling ones for sure. Of course, what would a western story about a sheriff be without his crime boss adversary? I'll strangle you and throw you off the balcony, you stinking little cocksucker. If you don't hurry to tell me where and what's left of that fucking dope that you and that other fucking weasel have been slamming into your dope fiend fucking vase during your fucking convalescence. God, Mr. Swearer. I just shit myself, sir. I'm saying it now before the smell gets you. You shit yourself? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Throw yourself off the balcony. Go, Jimmy. Come on. Come on. Get your shit smeared ass off my balcony. Go! 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 Oh. I hurt my arm, but I'm okay. You fucking lie there now. I'm just gonna roll forward so I, so I don't get trampled. To all the people who haven't seen Deadwood yet, I'm sure you must have noticed how colorful the language in this show is. It's probably a surprise seeing all these outlaws and country bumpkins speaking like Shakespeare characters in between all of the swearing and calling each other cocksuckers, but it makes sense when you consider that during the Victorian era where this show takes place, Shakespeare's work was some of the most popular reading material back then. If you only have 10 words, they have to mean an awful lot of different things. And so uh, what you begin to discover very quickly is a complication of meaning freighted by the same word. If, if you read the newspapers of the time, the most unbearable purple prose, because anyone who was educated was educated on the Victorian novels. So there was the cohabitation of the, 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 the primitively obscene with this kind of or, ornate presentation. And, and uh, what I found was uh, that in the, in the documentation, that people who were exposed to that environment, who survived, their language was still ornate, but it became very vital. I'll tell you this, son, you can mark my words. Crazy horse winning the little bighorn bought his people on good long-term ass fucking. You do not want to be a dirt-worshipping heathen from this fucking point forward. Pardon my French. Oh, I speak French. So uh, there was a tremendous energy in the language. 
and it was the only social form until there was government. Uh, those who could speak well became the leaders, the orators. Certain parts of the dialogue do stretch realism here and there, but I would say it's a fair trade-off when you get a character like Al Swearingen, whose vocabulary could make any Martin Scorsese character blush, while also making them feel like complete idiots at the same time. Swearingen serves as the main source of conflict in the show's first season, and Seth's biggest obstacle towards making Deadwood a more safe and secure place. Don't take that to mean he's just a one-dimensional, mustache-twirling crime boss, though. If you were to ask Al what he wants, it wouldn't be to take over Deadwood or establish a criminal empire. He's just a guy out to make a comfy living for himself, without having to worry about being hamstrung or robbed by government types. True, he does beat and murder people on almost a daily basis, but that's mostly based around him punishing them for their incompetence or doing something that costs him profit. As much as Al doesn't want to admit it, he knows it's only a matter of time before Deadwood ceases to be a lawless camp. And when that day comes, people like him are either going to be forced out or forced to conform to the new order. Until then, he just wants to make money and bask in the camp's anarchy for as long as he can. The main reason he feels so threatened by the arrivals of Seth Bullock and Cy Tolliver is because they represent the two things he despises most change and competition. That's why there's an air of desperation behind many of his schemes in Season 1, since most of them are just his wild reactions to anything new and unexpected that catches his attention. Some of his plans, like trying to drug Alma in order to buy her out successfully, or commissioning his right-hand man Dan to murder a little girl who may be a witness to his crimes, end up turning some of his most loyal people against him, but it's all to maintain the level of control and security he had at the beginning of the show. I don't like... The Pinkertons. Being the Hearst Combine and their fucking ill got their eyes on taking over here, your stay in suits my purpose. As much as you can, please minimize your obscenities. Anyways, those are my prejudices and personal interests for siding with you. Also, if you want to match their 50, that'll be between you and your god. Don't get me wrong, Al Swearingen is still a nasty piece of work, but there's no denying he's more of a tragic character whose perspective was built around his brutal upbringing and first-hand experience about how cruel the world can be than an outright villain. What makes his dynamic with Seth Bullock so compelling is that while the two men hate each other to the core, there's also an unspoken respect between them over their dedication to the camp. Swearingen was against the idea of even having a sheriff at all throughout most of Season 1, but he ends up making Seth put on the badge himself, because there's nobody else he actually respects enough to take up the role, and he recognizes that Deadwood needs someone like him in order to face what lies ahead. I think if Bullock had been Swearingen's age, one of them would have killed the other. But Swearingen is childless, and Bullock is fatherless. And there's some sense in which Swearingen recognizes Bullock as kind of his kid. There was a real intention behind it, trying to hit Bullock on top of the head and say, look, there's a lot of shit going on here, and I need you. And, and you got to pull your end of the deal. Can be combat. It's a rite of initiation. He takes Bullock through an accelerated adolescence, say, and and by provoking the attack, really, it, it, he's bringing about the reconciliation. This doesn't make them friends by any stretch, which becomes very apparent at the beginning of season two. But there are more than a few cases where Al pushes Seth to make the right decisions for the people who depend on him most. He may be the most reviled and untrustworthy person in all of Deadwood, but Al's blunt nature and disregard for decency is what makes him the most decisive person in the camp, and the one responsible for most of the characters around him to go through radical changes. One of my favorite moments of the show that perfectly showcases this is how he treats the priest after he comes down with a brain tumor. Everyone else would rather humor him or make him feel comfortable as he slowly goes insane, but the idea that it's merciful to let him rot away from the inside and lose all of his dignity is completely disgusting to Al. He believes putting him out of his misery would be more merciful than cruel, especially after his experiences dealing with his late brother's mental issues. It may be a decision most people would disagree with on principle, but it's one Al is willing to make and be damned for because no one else will. 
In spite of all of his heinous acts of murder, extortion, and rampant racism, which funnily enough, David Milch was accused of being a rampant anti-Semite for all of the negative Jew comments in the show, despite being Jewish himself, Al Swearingen still comes off as a believable person doing everything he can to push himself and others around him to survive. I can't give enough credit to Ian McShane's performance, who practically steals every scene he's in between his fun mannerisms, heartfelt speeches, tense encounters with Seth Bullock, and his ability to sound like an Oxford scholar while he's also swearing like a drunken sailor. He may not evolve as much as the other characters around him, but ironically, that's what makes him so engaging. Many of the most enjoyable parts of Deadwood for me were just seeing his reactions to whatever new character or storyline popped up in that particular episode, regardless if it only led to an offhand snide comment or a multi-part nefarious scheme. You know you've got a winning character when he can deliver some of the most captivating dialogue in your entire show while also being serviced by a prostitute at the same time. And since this was HBO back during its golden age, when they were actually focused on creating sophisticated stories over fetish material, he's still the main focus of the scene. You're wrong not to trust him. He formed a party that found that little one among all the dead of her family. Didn't he also shoot a man he suspected in the murders? Supposing it was road agents, and they hear his talk. Where's the little one standing in? You got a dark turn of mind. I see as much misery out of them moving to justify themselves as them that set out to do harm. For this section, I intend to go over all of the supporting characters whose stories mainly exist to flesh out what's going on in the rest of Deadwood outside of the major events that usually affect the entire camp that are driven by Seth, Al, and Cy Tolliver on occasion. That'll make it easier for me to cover many characters in a shorter span of time and to demonstrate how they influence the major characters and events while also being compelling stories that help build the world around them. I'll start with Charlie Utter and Calamity Jane, the two people who usually have Seth's back more than anyone else across the show. From the beginning, neither one really thought much of Deadwood when they first arrived with their friend, Wild Bill Hickok. Sure, Charlie had his plan of starting his postal business once things settled down, but he and Jane's main motivation for sticking around was just to be by Bill's side as he toiled away every day drinking and gambling. When Seth enlists the help to go after Al's hired thugs after they murdered an innocent family on the road, this sparks the three of them to take more interest in what's going on in the camp outside of this situation. Jane, who was mainly defined as being nothing more than a loudmouth drunk with a short temper, takes it upon herself to look after the girl they rescued and support whatever Seth does next in case he ever needs her help again. What I really appreciate about Jane's story is that the show never made her a girl boss gunslinger who could take out anybody in the blink of an eye. She's tough for a fact, but the scene where she completely folds as Al Swearingen threatens the little girl's life is all the more powerful because it's a believable reaction and it pushes her to back up her tough claims by standing guard over the girl all night and never lose her nerve like that again. You don't want to interfere with me. You think I'm scared of you? Sure you are. If I take a knife to you, you'll be scared worse than a long time dying. I ain't scared to die. I ain't scared of nobody. Do it to me if you have to! Why would I do it to you? Jane and Charlie go on similar but separate arcs of being lost souls, trying to figure out what to do with themselves while in Deadwood. It may seem like aimless wandering at first, but it makes sense when you consider that the core theme behind Deadwood is all about people trying to start new lives and put the past behind them. Charlie discovers this through his many interactions and eventual friendship with Seth Bullock, resolving to work by his side as a trusted deputy. Jane, on the other hand, figures out that as much as she'd like to be nothing more than a wayward drunk who ignores all of her personal issues, Helping others in need, like Seth and Bill do, brings out her better nature as well as a way to cope with all of her problems through others. My best friend died. The man I had my best friend feeling about in the world. Took you as he found you. Thought the best to you. I apologize. Well, if you don't stop apologizing, I'm not gonna give you a goddamn rough. And coming back with some water. I apologize. Shut the fuck up! 
Jane can come across as a wild card with no direction, as she cycles through multiple storylines with very loose cohesion between them, but all of them carry the idea that helping others is what brings out the best in her, whether it's working beside Doc Cochran to take care of plague victims, ensuring the little girl Sophia has been taken good care of by Alma Garrett, and backing up Seth or Charlie in their law enforcement duties when called for. Speaking of Alma Garrett, let's move on to her story. At the beginning of the show, she's nothing more than the miserable half of an arranged marriage, who heavily relies on opium to get through each day. The stress only gets worse when she's left alone in the camp, and is constantly being hounded by Al and his cronies to buy out her seemingly useless gold claim, while also having to deal with raising the orphan Sophia by herself. Late congratulations on the claim proven out. May I go downstairs? Mr. Swear Engines only come to talk, Sophia. You frighten her. I'll have that effect. I think specifically it was your plotting against her life. I'd take tea. Deadwood doesn't shy away from just how difficult it was being a woman back then, and that gets put on display many times as she's forced to accept terrible situations that are just simply out of her control, people looking to take advantage of her at every opportunity, and having to live with the fact that she has no power to change a situation on any massive scale. These ideas are pushed plenty with Trixie and the other working girls of the camp, but it's pretty grim seeing just how trapped Alma is in her situation despite her wealth and status. It's also one of the big reasons she becomes so enamored with Seth Bullock, a man willing to take on life or death situations head on, both for himself and for others in need. Once he agrees to protect her interests by the request of Wild Bill Hickok, this pushes Alma to take more control over her life, through fighting off her addiction, starting up Deadwood's first bank, and standing up to weasels like E.B. Farnham and her own father for trying to manipulate her. While her relationship with Seth gets fairly complicated going forward, particularly when his wife and her son turn up in town, she still takes the initiative to manage her own affairs and make Deadwood a suitable home for her and Sophia. It's a very gradual change at first, but Molly Parker does a great job showing Alma change from being timid and unassuming and becoming a strong-willed and proud woman for her time. It really makes you nostalgic for the 2000s, where you could still have shows about female characters going through believable arcs and becoming strong women without diminishing their feminine traits, or bash every man around them in order to make them seem empowered. Would you prefer, Mr. Bullock, that Alma stay in the camp? In any case, I've decided to stay. And of course, if the New York courts had jurisdiction, they'd sell the holdings to the highest bidder. Not many here would give a damn what a New York court held or didn't. Excuse my language. On the contrary, Mr. Bullock. Thank you for acknowledging my presence. Watching you struggle with what is beneath your spirit to understand is always painful for me. All right, Danny. But in consideration, you will remove yourself from further connection to the venture. I'll have that in writing before I help you. No, darling. You'll help me, and you'll have no such thing. Get away from her. Uh, Mr. Swearingen, ma'am, uh, though I believe you yourself did not request an interview. Tell Mr. Swearingen I will receive him at 2 o'clock. Uh, a penny for your thoughts. I'm glad to be leaving your company. One aspect I really like about Alma's story is how it inspires other characters in the show itself, most notably Al's favorite working girl Trixie and Doc Cochran. Both of them were fairly loyal to Al, in spite of his harsh treatment towards them at times, until they saw the full depth of his schemes with Alma and Sophia. Trixie was just meant to serve as a babysitter for Sophia to dope Alma to ensure she would take Al's buyout without question, but her interactions with them pushed her to defy Al and help her overcome her addiction with the doctor's help. Meanwhile, Doc Cochran is well aware of how monstrous Al can be, but refuses to sit by and let him kill Sophia after seeing how much he shook up Jane with his threats. I was already predisposed to like his character because it's impossible to hate Brad Dourif in anything, but the scene where he refuses to step aside and let Dan kill the girl in one of the early episodes is still one of the best moments of the entire show. Between that and a slit throat that Al will give me if I leave that child alive, I think you know which one I'm gonna choose. You just go ahead and do what you're gonna do, cause I'm not moving. You're pitting me against Al. So the fuck did. 
Being a seasoned veteran of the Civil War, Doc Cochran has seen some of the cruelest inclinations of mankind imaginable. That's why he can mostly put up with the rampant deaths across Deadwood and Al Swearingen's cruel antics to an extent. But he steadily becomes more noble and caring across the show after seeing what Trixie, Jane, and Jewel are willing to do in order to improve their lives and do some good. That doesn't mean he becomes a hopeless optimist like JD from Scrubs, but he certainly becomes more endearing towards people he didn't think that much of when they first met. And it's clear from the few episodes where he had to help Al pass some kidney stones, which is guaranteed to make you squirm more than the average death in Game of Thrones, that he's committed to doing everything he can to not take another life unnecessarily, even if it's the life of a terrible person like Al. Trixie, on the other hand, steadily goes more distant with Al as the show goes on, first when going behind his back to help Alma, and later when she develops feelings for Seth's partner Saul, and resolves putting aside her prostitute lifestyle to learn banking skills from him. Even though the two of them are still fond of each other to some degree, as shown when Trixie can't help but rush in whenever something major happens around Al, or Al providing some small encouragements for her here and there, the two of them drifting apart is portrayed to be a necessary step for both of them to move forward in their lives. This is all framed as just a minor side story that happens alongside all of the major events in the show, only for Trixie Trixie's actions and a connection to Al both coming back to haunt her at the end of the show, turning this minor side story into one of the key plot points that defines the show's finale. Do you want me back at the hotel or do you want to do something to me? Now why would I want you to go back there? Hmm? Or rely on anything you said transpired after you lied about her taking that dope? Huh? That little one needs someone to care for her. And maybe get her the fuck out of here. So you want me back over there and to tell you what they fucking decide? Do you want to rip my fucking guts out? Why did you go to him? I've lived most of my life a whore. And as much as he's her misery, the pimp's a whore's familiar. So the sudden stranger violent draws her to him. Not that I wouldn't learn another way. That right there is why Deadwood's side stories and characters stand apart from any other TV show. Very few parts of Deadwood feel like filler because almost anything can end up being reincorporated later in unexpected ways, and it comes across as completely organic storytelling because it follows believable cause and effect. Even if you don't like a particular character, it's still amazing to see what kind of effect they can have on everything around them. That was my experience with Side Tolliver. Even though he's one of the most despicable people in all of Deadwood, both through his actions and the people he associates with, it's through those decisions that characters like Joni Stubbs, Charlie Utter, and Seth Bullock take the most defining steps in their stories. As monstrous as Psy can be, even he is shown to have a humane side when it comes to dealing with Joni, and you can't help feeling for him just a little bit, considering almost all of his attempts to become more respected and valuable to the people coming to Deadwood usually blow up in his face spectacularly. I don't think I enjoyed that bullshit, Joni. Certain things you have to do to impress upon people what you're willing to do. Do you like it? No. Do you enjoy it? No. Do you have to look like you do? Yes. You bring the warmth into my life. I can't bear to see you unhappy like this. If you don't kill me or let me go, I'm gonna kill you. Like I said earlier, you know you're dealing with good writing when you have every reason to hate a character, but you can still follow their line of logic and sympathize with them on some level. By that same metric, the heroic characters are just as compelling because they face just as many struggles if not more than the villains, yet aspire to do good when they can instead of letting those hardships break them. Deadwood was one of the best at following this philosophy, but sadly, it couldn't last forever. Despite all of the awards it was winning for its writing and performances, the show got cancelled by its third season in 2007 because of low ratings and new management taking over HBO deciding to cancel everything that was in production at the time to make more fetish material like True Blood and Euphoria. Fortunately, after over a decade, the show received an actual satisfying conclusion in the form of Deadwood the movie.
The Deadwood movie takes place over 10 years after the end of the original series, and picks up with most of the original characters. The production behind this movie is an entire story in itself, because David Milch had to tirelessly campaign for years just to get it made, and unfortunately, it's likely to be the last thing he'll ever make since he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease when the movie was released in 2019. Putting all that aside, the Deadwood movie had pretty big shoes to fill when it came to wrapping up every storyline that was left in the air by the end of the show. Like how was Seth Bullock going to confront a filthy witch juggernaut like George Hurst on all of his crimes and shady dealings? What's the town going to be like now that it's officially part of the US territory? And what's Al Swearingen going to do if the secret he covered up at the end of the show gets revealed? It moves me greatly, returning after years have passed, to witness the changes wrought by time, ingenuity, and invention. We who gather have known together some portion of which must still be measured in blood. Yet the Deadwood community does enter its adulthood. And don't our spirits raise, you murdering, conniving, thieving cocksucker. The movie answers these questions for the most part, and manages to tell a compelling story that gives almost every character a satisfying conclusion. The plot can be pretty slow at first, which is understandable since it has to reintroduce various characters after spending many years apart, but things pick up fast by the half hour mark with the death of a major character that sparks an all out feud between Seth Bullock and George Hurst. Anyone who was disappointed by the lack of action in the original show is likely going to enjoy the movie's faster pace and more frequent gunfights. There's still plenty of well-written drama, so it still feels like classic Deadwood that's moving at a much brisker, climactic pace since it only has two hours to tell this story instead of an entire season. The Ironers. Who did? I expect you believe a badge insulates you from certain untoward consequences. Much as you're being a U.S. Senator, will insulate you from jail. I'm coming for you, Marshal. Expect you will, Senator. If there's one issue I have with the movie, it's that some parts can feel dragged out, while others feel like they pass by too fast. Alma, for example, can feel like a background character compared to her role in the original series, and her only real contribution to the story is putting to bed her relationship with Seth Bullock. By contrast, Joni is way more inconsequential to the story than Alma, but pops up several times, mainly to make things awkward between her and Jane. I'll admit, this is more of a personal nitpick than an actual flaw in the movie, since I wasn't a big fan of their romance subplot in the show either. Putting all of that aside, I still highly recommend the Deadwood movie to anyone who's finished the series. It's a nice treat for the people who were burned by the show's original cancellation, and it's a great send-off for some of the best written characters in all of television. When it comes to movies that are made to wrap up a beloved TV show that was cancelled too soon, like Serenity or Farscape the Peacekeeper Wars, it's hard to not get a bittersweet feeling when watching them because you know it's the last you'll see of these great characters you spent so much time getting to know. And you can just imagine how many more amazing stories you could have told if shows like Farscape, Hannibal, and Daredevil got to run for multiple seasons instead of the handful we got. While the Deadwood movie does evoke some of those feelings in me, it's still a fitting conclusion that I could see the original show going out with if it had gone to this point after multiple seasons. Even if it wasn't the original plan to end things this way, it still comes across as the true definitive ending to this story and these characters. Which is more than I can say for many other shows that got cancelled too soon and were forced to wrap things up sooner than expected. I don't see how you can't admire what David Milch and the rest of the cast and crew went through just to go out on the bittersweet note that Deadwood deserved. It definitely isn't made to cater to newcomers though, so while anyone who hasn't seen Deadwood can understand what's going on to an extent, it won't be as satisfying of an experience as watching the entire show first and getting the full context for how everything led up to this point.
When I first heard about Deadwood a few years ago, I wasn't expecting to get invested in it because I didn't care much for westerns back then. At the time, I only saw them as stale and formulaic stories that were mostly made for people who were fascinated with that era. After watching Deadwood and several other classic westerns, I realized there's much more to the genre than all the cliches people are familiar with, like noble gunslingers saving helpless damsels from one-dimensional villains, shabby one-street towns filled with tumbleweeds, or stories about pure good versus pure evil in general. I also realized that many modern stories people love today are filled with tropes that came from classic westerns. Even if some people don't care for the mere idea of cowboys in 10-gallon hats riding across a desert frontier, many of those same people will turn right around and say they love stories about superheroes who carve their own path in a dangerous world where the law either doesn't exist or abuses the average citizen. Even if it's just one person against an endless barrage of self-serving and corrupt people, they'll stop at nothing to fight for the ideals of honor and virtue. Hell, look at most of science fiction, which is mostly about humanity discovering new frontiers and trying to live stable lives in worlds or environments that are completely alien to them. Westerns may not be as popular as they were in their heyday, but their concepts and themes are still very much alive in stories you wouldn't expect to be associated with them. In fact, given how restrictive and close-minded modern society can be these days, it seems more and more people are gravitating towards stories about people finding their independent spirit and striving to live by their terms instead of on the whims of some nebulous power above them who insists they know better. That's what people in the Old West and in the real Deadwood had to struggle with. And once you see how David Milch and his team presented those struggles, it becomes clear just how much more there is to a Western beyond those popular cliches, and why their ideas have carried across multiple stories throughout the decades. Like I said at the beginning, Deadwood can be a hard show to get into between its slower pacing and complex dialogue. But, unlike the average Disney Plus show, once you get over those hurdles and learn more about the characters, it's a show with enough compelling drama and well-earned action that can hook you from the beginning of season 1 all the way to the end of the movie. Deadwood stands apart from many modern stories with a slower pace, because in truth, many of their plots are actually pretty basic and can easily be resolved in an hour or two. So they try to hide that fact by packing in a bunch of filler, or literally have the characters talk in unnaturally long and awkward pauses to drag out each scene. Meanwhile, Deadwood is filled with numerous shifting plots and characters that are all happening at the same time, and can have a profound influence on each other when they build to a certain point. To put it simply, Deadwood actually justifies its runtime with its ever-evolving plot, and pays off the time investment. Even if a certain story can feel directionless and unfocused at times, you can trust David Milch to take it in an interesting direction that will end up having a major effect on either the world or the characters involved with it. That's why Deadwood is worth watching all these years later, and shouldn't be forgotten anytime soon. Thanks for watching. I already have an idea of which TV show I want to do a recommendation video on next, but I'm also considering doing smaller videos here and there to fill in the gaps between these bigger retrospective style videos. You can follow me on Twitter, or X if anyone actually calls it that, to see any channel updates or my thoughts on certain current events. I'm the Elusive Eye. Happy travels!